Over in Pakistan, there's trouble brewing. Or should I say more trouble brewing? Police officers have surrounded Imran Khan's house in Lahore. They're setting up roadblocks. They're patrolling the streets. It looks like the calm before the storm. Everyone seems to be asking the same question. Will Imran Khan be arrested again? He released another video, a video address on Wednesday. This is what he said. I heard इनके ऊपर कोई घर के ऊपर कार्रवाई होगी 40 दहशत गर्द को पकड़ने के लिए मेरी रिक्वेस्ट है आपको कि 40 दहशत गर्द अगर घर में हैं तो मेरी जिंदगी को भी खतरा है मेहरबानी करके जरूर आए यहां लेकिन इस तरह ना आए कि कोई दावा बोल के इस तरह करें सर्च वारंट लेके आए एक मौसम माशे की तरह आए आए कि कोई नाम तो दे ये दहशत गर्द है कौन और आए Imran Khan says his arrest is imminent and looking at the pictures, that seems to be the case. But the government of Pakistan disagrees. Here's what they are saying. Imran Khan is hiding 40 suspects involved in last week's violence. If they're released, the siege will end. That's what the government says. And if they're not, well, use your imagination. Imran Khan had been summoned by investigation officers today. There are more than 100 cases against him. This one was linked to the Al Qadir case, but Imran Khan skipped the summon. He sent a written response instead, and that was snub number one. Snub number two came on social media. Look at what Imran Khan is saying, and I'm quoting. Nation has been taken over by a bunch of crooks, criminals and duffers devoid of any ethics or morality. So he's on the war path. He has no intention of giving in yet. And where does that leave the army? Army Chief General Asim Munir broke his silence on Wednesday and it was about time. He was visiting the Sialkot garrison and this is what he said. I'm quoting again. The armed forces will not tolerate any further attempt of violating the sanctity and security of its installations or vandalism. We are resolved to bring to justice all the planners, abettors, instigators and executors of vandalism on the black day of 9th May. That's the army chief of Pakistan. And he's talking about last Tuesday. Imran Khan supporters had flooded the streets. Some of them had stormed military installations. So now the army chief has promised action, or rather, revenge. What does the army plan to do with them? Military leaders say they will be tried under the Army Act. And this would be a drastic step. The Army Act is usually meant for soldiers and officers. The trials are not done in civilian courts. They're done in military courts. And the punishment, even life sentence and death penalty. You can see why the Army would like that. The civilian courts have protected Imran Khan once. Chances are they will protect him again. So why not take the courts out of the equation completely? Why not try his supporters in military courts? Prime Minister Sheba Sharif has supported the idea. He's calling for the toughest punishment possible. ये पुकार पुकार कर ये मुतालबा उनका है कि जो बेगुनाह हैं उनको हाथ न लगाया जाए जो गुनागार हैं किसी भी हवाले से उनको करारवा की सजा मिलेगी तो फिर रहती दुनिया तक आइंदा इस तरह का वाकया दोबारा रुनवा नहीं होगा सो दैट्स वेयर थिंग्स स्टैंड द आर्मी हैज कॉर्नर्ड इमरान खान इन लाहौर व्हाट डज ही डू नेक्स्ट इज दिस द लास्ट स्टैंड or is it the start of something bigger? The last time around, the army made a big mistake. They went for the head of the snake. They arrested Imran Khan first. We all know what happened next. This time, they're using a bottom-up approach. Around 7,000 of his party workers have been arrested. Some senior leaders are also in jail, like Fawad Chaudhry. He was Imran Khan's loose cannon minister. Chaudhry had been released by the Islamabad High Court on Tuesday. He was happily heading home when this happened. Videos like that will intimidate leaders. Reports say many PTI leaders have quit the party. A lot of them have quit politics altogether. So here's the question. If Imran Khan is arrested again, will there be a repeat of last week? Or has the army action frightened them? This will be the real test of Imran Khan's support. So Ukraine is waging a diplomatic offensive, not just to woo the global south, but also to convince its biggest ally in this war, the United States of America. 
Turns out all is not well between the two partners. For months, Ukraine has been asking for fighter jets, but Washington has refused. So now Ukraine has started a pressure campaign. It has roped in Europe, and it's finding support there. The idea is to put pressure on the U.S. and force it into giving Ukraine what it wants. The effort began this week. Zelensky hopped around key European capitals. Everywhere he went, he asked for fighter jets. Italy and the UK were on board. Germany remained non-committal. France agreed, even offered to train Ukrainian pilots. We have opened the door to training the pilots. In France? Ukrainian pilots in France? And we're doing this with several other European countries which are ready, and talks are ongoing with the Americans. London is willing to push the needle even further. They announced an international coalition, an alliance to help Ukraine get F-16s. That's an American warplane, remember, F-16. Yes, look, we, we are going to be a key part of the coalition of countries that provides that support to Vladimir and Ukraine. Now, it is not a straightforward thing, as Vladimir and I have been discussing, to make build up that fighter uh, combat aircraft capability. It's not just the provision of planes, it's also the training of pilots and all the logistics that go alongside that. Now, the UK can play a big part of that. Who else is part of this coalition? Reports say the Netherlands and Belgium. Just like France, they're willing to train Ukrainian pilots. Denmark, too, is said to be involved in the discussions, but we're not sure if they're formally part of this coalition. In the past, though, they have expressed willingness to share their F-16s with Ukraine. So it sounds like the pieces are finally falling in place. But there's a small hiccup. Who would Ukraine get these planes from? Like I said before, the F-16 is an American plane. It is built by a company called Lockheed Martin, an American company. Several NATO countries use this plane. So Ukraine can get it from two sources, either the United States directly or one of its NATO allies. Now, so far, Washington has refused to share these jets. So Ukraine is depending on its European partners. They would like Europe to share the F-16s with them. But even that is complicated. You see, for any third-party transfer, you need permission from Washington. So unless America agrees, this transfer cannot happen. Listen to what the British Defence Secretary said today. We can do what we've done throughout this, and, and Germany has been doing this with us uh, in the International Donor Coordination Cell in, in Rammstein, which is we can enable other people who wish to. So if, if it, uh, Boris is right, you know, this is up to the White House to decide whether it wants to release that technology. So where does Biden stand on this? He hasn't said yet. A few months back, the Pentagon was asked about this. A senior official said, I don't think we are opposed. Those were his words. At the same time, he also said that a decision has not been made yet. So the U.S. has avoided the issue so far, but it will soon have to make up its mind. Important meetings are lined up in the weeks and months ahead where this issue is expected to be discussed. The G7 summit this week, for instance, or the NATO summit in July. So America will have to decide sooner rather than later. Why are they hesitating, though? Why won't the U.S. share F-16s with Ukraine? Because it wants to avoid a direct conflict with Russia. If Ukraine gets the F-16s, Putin will have another reason to escalate this war. And who knows, Moscow may see American and European targets as fair game. And that's the scenario that the U.S. is trying to avoid. Same with Germany. Here's what their defense minister said. The Auschwitz I'm not a person who adheres to neverisms. I can't say today for certain that today's answer will not be a different one in three years. It is all a question of circumstance, of course. At this moment, we are not there yet, and we have not changed our position on this. That may give Joe Biden some breathing room, but the issue will not die anytime soon, because Ukraine won't stop trying. Meanwhile, China is also trying to make new friends or perhaps steal some of Russia's. What are we talking about? China is courting five Central Asian nations this week. It's holding a summit, the China Central Asia Summit, the first of its kind. The venue is the city of Xi'an in China, one of the most populated cities in Western China, also historically significant. At one point, Xi'an was considered the starting point of the Silk Road, the ancient trade route that connected China to Europe. It went through medieval Central Asia. It enriched everyone along the way. Xi Jinping wants to stress on that ancient connection. He wants Central Asia on board for his new Silk Road. It's called the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. He also wants to use this opportunity to expand his sphere of influence. You see, these former Soviet republics have historically been dependent on Moscow. 
But now that Russia is busy in Ukraine, China wants to swoop in. Our next report has more. There's a historic summit taking place in China. A summit between Xi Jinping and the leaders of five Central Asian nations. They're meeting in the western Chinese city of Xi'an. When the Central Asian leaders arrived, they were given a grand welcome. Song and dance and honor guards greeted them as they stepped off their planes. Xi Jinping didn't hold back. But why is China so invested in this summit? Because it sees a golden opportunity, a chance to strengthen partnerships while the rest of the world tries to decouple from China. The five nations invited are Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. They all lie between China, Russia and Iran, at a critical juncture between the West and the East. China has already invested billions in the region as part of its Belt and Road Initiative. That's China's plan to create an overland trade route linking it to Europe. The name and trajectory of the BRI are a nod to the ancient Silk Road. The Silk Road connected China to Europe for thousands of years. It passed through the region where the five Central Asian nations now lie. So it's no coincidence that the city of Xi'an was chosen for the summit. I would like to extend a warm welcome to President Tokayev to attend the summit in Xi'an at my invitation. I'm very happy to play host to Mr. President. Your Excellency, Mr. President, I am very happy to meet you in the ancient city of Xi'an. Distinguished Mr. President, I am really glad to meet you in Xi'an, the start point of the ancient Silk Road and the ancient city with historic significance. We are looking forward to the China-Central Asia summit to be held tomorrow. Xi is meeting the Central Asian leaders individually today. Tomorrow there will be a joint summit. China is expected to pledge higher investment in Central Asia, in the railways and natural gas sectors. There are also talks about reducing trade barriers and pledges of everlasting friendship. The two sides should vigorously carry forward the traditional friendship, firmly support each other, deepen mutually beneficial cooperation, jointly pursue development and rejuvenation, and build a China-Kazakhstan community with a shared future featuring everlasting friendship, strong mutual trust and solidarity. This may not go down well with Russia. You see, all five nations that China has invited are former Soviet states. They became independent after the fall of the USSR, and they've remained in Russia's sphere of influence. Now, that may be changing. Russia is busy with the war in Ukraine, and these countries are stepping out of its shadow. Kazakhstan has refused to recognize Russia's annexation of Ukrainian regions. Tajikistan has demanded more respect from Russia. Their unease over the war makes sense. Ukraine is a former Soviet state, just like them. So courting China makes sense, at least for now. It's not clear how Moscow will deal with this. Guess the response will have to wait until after the war. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. We're starting with Turkey. A storm sent a sofa flying off a balcony of a high-rise building. In Cambodia, the 32nd Southeast Asian Games have been concluded with a spectacular closing ceremony. And the wreckage of the Titanic has been fully visualized in 3D for the first time ever. Also, what makes the 18th of May significant? We're taking you back in history on this day. NASA launched Apollo 10 mission. The year was 1969. The purpose of this mission was to cover all aspects of crewed lunar landing, except the landing itself. It was the first crewed Apollo spacecraft to operate around the moon. The mission also sent the first color TV pictures of the moon's surface to Earth. We're leaving you with this. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.
Raptors radio back. Welcome back to Earth. Billy Pugh. Uh, Billy Pugh is an old bosun in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, Gene Cernan first, then John Young, then Colonel Stafford. exchanges from inside the BBC, they talk about the risk of violating Indian laws. It's easier to rake up the freedom of speech debate, but does it give anyone a free pass to knowingly violate the law? America supports India because it needs India's support in return. And India is working with the US because it suits India's interests. This is how geopolitics works. Last night, he diffused a crisis with his defense minister. But today, Netanyahu was confronted with a new problem. His cabinet seems to have rebelled against him. The UK is looking at the Indian subcontinent to fill its coffers. That India seems to be negotiating from a position of power, like a partner and not a former colonist. 